comes from the Old Testament book of Jonah. We're reading the first three verses of the first chapter, Jonah 1, 1 through 3. Let us pray. Father, as your word is read and proclaimed, may your Holy Spirit move among us in such a way that it just comes alive to us. So we thank you for what you're about to do, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. And after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. This is the word of God by the people of God. Thanks be to God. We, we wrap our series up today of people God uses. And over the past few weeks, we've, we've realized that God uses uh, humans... Uh, frail, feeble humans to do his work, uh, fulfill his plan. We've learned that there's, through these characters we've uh, studied, we've learned that there are several characteristics that they have that make them useful and things that we can do as well. But here's the question today. What do we do when God calls us to do something we don't want to do? I mean, obviously we can ignore him and figure he'll find somebody else. Or we can come up with a lot of valid reasons why he should choose someone else. I think we call those excuses, but that's another story. Well, this is the situation Jonah found himself in. God had called him to do something he didn't want to do. Now, I presume we've at least heard about Jonah. We most often associate Jonah with with what? A whale. Yeah, that's right. So Jonah was a prophet. And he, he was a prophet in Israel from 793 to 753 B.C. You know, we count backwards in the B.C. part. And as we just read, God called him to preach, but we just read Jonah had other ideas. In fact, he planned a long vacation in the opposite direction of Nineveh. Now, to be fair, it also says that Nineveh was a wicked city. In fact, it's one of the wickedest cities in that part of the world at that time. So, after all, who in their right mind would want to go there? But the Bible's pretty clear about Jonah's motive. It says twice he was fleeing from God. And that's what we're doing when we say no to God. We're fleeing from God. So he gets on a ship, and as we read further in chapter 1, God sent a storm to that part of the sea. Now, Jonah was secure in his decision. Maybe, maybe he thought, well, God will forget me and he'll choose somebody else or I'm too far away from God or whatever his thought was. But he went off to sleep and the storm didn't wake him up. Now, the crew on the top of the ship was frantic. And, and the captain comes down to wake him up. He says, why are you sleeping? We're about to perish. Call upon your God to save us. Now, it says a little, a little bit later that they cast lots. Now, in essence, they drew straws to see who was the cause of this. Now, God did use that process, casting lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, Jonah, to his credit, did say, okay, it's my fault. It's my fault. Now, it's interesting how God can do some pretty intense things to get our attention. A storm will do that, won't it? So Jonah said, hey, throw me overboard. Well, they did. And the storm ended. So here's Jonah in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. It's not the Atlantic or Pacific, but it's a big body of water. Now, this had not occurred to me before. Here's Jonah, far, we don't know how far they had sailed, far away from land. He's now in the middle of the ocean, the sea. Now, how's he going to get back to land? He could have drowned. Ah, but look in verse 17. God sent a great fish. Doesn't say whale. But I mean, it, logically, the, 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 I've read that like the sperm whale has probably got a big enough throat to have swallowed a human. But if the, if the great fish had not come along, Jonah could have drowned. 
The story would have been over. But he spends three days and three nights in the belly of this great fish. So what does it take for God to get our attention? There's a lot of things that, that we realize we, we have had happen to us that God was getting our attention. So God got Jonah's attention. So chapter 2 comes and Jonah is praying inside this fish. You know, sometimes God needs us to be broken to use us. doesn't have to be, but sometimes it takes that. And Jonah has now humbled himself to God and prayed and offered himself to God. And so God then commands this great fish to head back towards dry land, towards Nineveh. And he spits him out onto the shore. How many of you have watched the Veggie Tales, Jonah? <laughs> I keep wanting to say, Jonah was a prophet. Ooh, ooh. Right, anyway. <laughs> you, you, if you haven't seen it, you need to watch Jonah and the big fish as a veggie tale. But he gets his attention. He sends the fish back. He spits him out. I don't know what he smelled like when he got out of there, but I'm sure it wasn't good. But here's where there's some humor in the Bible. So look at, look at chapter 3 now. And, and, it, and it begins by, by saying, and God called to Jonah a second time. Go to Nineveh. I had a great uncle, Roy Starkey. He was my maternal grandfather's brother. And he told the story about our great grandmother. Uh, he said, she, she told me to go get a bucket of water. Well, of course, back then it was the pump. And it, I told her no. He says, you know what your great-grandmother did? She said, he said, she bloodied my nose. And then she said, go get a bucket of water. And he said, I did. Jonah goes to Nineveh. God is so gracious giving us second chances, isn't he? What our sign says, thankfully God allows U-turns. So he's, he's come to Nineveh. And the Bible says that it took three days just to walk across this town. And here's Jonah's sermon. Look at uh, chapter 3, the end of verse 4. Forty days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. Three days. He's walking along saying that. Now the word overthrown is the same word used in the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. So they probably got that word. But it's a pretty simple sermon. Hey, you got 40 days to get right with God. Amen. I could probably save us a lot of time on Sunday if that was my sermon. But verse 5 says the people believe God and a revival broke out. Look at verse 10. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Now you'd think Jonah would be happy, wouldn't you? But look at chapter 4. Jonah was angry. He said, this is the reason I did not want to come here in the first place. Now get this. He says, I know you're a gracious, forgiving God, and I knew you'd forgive those people. And I don't think they deserve it, is what he's saying. And then he asked God to take his life. Wow, some servant of God, huh? And God responded, is it right for you to be angry over what I have done? Do we ever think we know who should receive God's mercy and grace? So Jonah goes outside the town, climbs up on a hill, at least that's how it was in the Veggie Tales, and... <laughs> He waits to see what would happen. Now, maybe Jonah was thinking, okay, okay, I, I know what he's, he's said. I'll bet he's still going to get him. And so there he sits. And he waits. And he waits. And he waits. Like I say, maybe he thought they wouldn't respond to his message. And God would destroy this. And then, in a bit of irony, God brings a hot wind and the sun to beat down on Jonah's head and basically said to him, 
shouldn't I and you be concerned about the 120,000 people in that town? And that's where the story ends. Just like that, boom. The story of Jonah ends. You know, the Bible does that in several places. It stops. Don't you ever watch a movie or hear a story and think, how did it end? How did it end? But I think the Bible ends because then we need to put ourselves in the story. How might we have handled this? And maybe in the life of Jonah we see what not to do. I think I did this one time years ago and I, 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 preached, I, I said the title was, Is There a Big Fish in Your Future? <laughs> so as we close this series, uh, there are some truths that I want us to, to look at this morning about being a person God uses. First, God is always at work around us. God is always, God's not just sitting back and, and wait. God is actively working in people's lives. And, and from this narrative, we learn, I believe, God was at work in Nineveh because of the way they responded so quickly. See, the Holy Spirit is active in people's lives around us. We might be surprised at who God is working at here in the town of Pimento, at your workplace, in your family. Next, God invites us to become involved with him in his work. See, he was seeking to revive the people of Nineveh, and he invited Jonah to be part of that. So God spoke to Jonah just as he speaks to us in various ways to reveal what he's already doing. God was at work in Nineveh, and he says, Jonah, I need you to go there to work with me in that. He gets our attention in various ways to waken us up about what's going on around us. And he does that through the Holy Spirit, putting impressions on us, uh, the Bible or circumstances, the church, to reveal what he is up to. And he, he calls us to be obedient and attentive. So what is God inviting us to do here in his part of our world? Remember our mission. This is the mission statement of the United Methodist Church. The mission of a church is to make disciples, followers of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This is what we are about. We're called to make disciples. Now that, that ranges anywhere from somebody becoming a Christian to those of us in here to become more faithful followers of Jesus Christ. God's activity will always be about people. Hear that. God's activity is always about people and helping them take their next step towards Jesus. Now we might think he's calling us to finish this building addition. But actually he's calling us to finish this building addition so that it can be used by people to experience the love and grace of God through his church here. Next, God's invitation will always lead to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. I think we see that in the life of Jonah. He was confronted and he had a decision to make and he made the wrong one. He made it a whole lot more problematic for himself. But here's the thing. What we do next reveals what we believe about God. How we respond shows our belief. So what did Jonah believe about God? Well, he's, he kind of says he knew he was gracious and he was merciful, but he had an incorrect view of who Jonah thought should receive that grace. He didn't think the people of Nineveh deserved to be saved from destruction. Regardless of what we say we believe, what we do reveals what we believe. Sometimes God uses those invitations to reveal our deeper nature and what needs to be worked on. God is always calling us to be more like Jesus. And often, well not often, it's always in conflict with our human nature. So there's a crisis of faith that comes about. Jonah got on a boat and headed in the opposite direction. Next, we must make major adjustments in our lives to join God in what He is doing. And like we said, I think it was last week we said what God calls us to is God-sized God-sized, big jobs that only God can help us be successful in. 
and it requires adjustments because we're going to be doing something we've never done before or, or we're going to be dealing with uh, our status quo. Hey, it's just as comfortable to sit back on a Wednesday night or a Sunday morning or whenever God calls us to do something and let somebody else do it. Sacrifice will be involved from our status quo. God's invitation caused Jonah to make major adjustments, didn't it? And see, this is often the reason we don't want to obey God. is because our status quo, our comfort zone is threatened. True faith will require action. True faith requires responding to God's invitation with a yes. You know, in the book of James, it talks about faith and actions. It often sounds like it's good works working our way to heaven. No. James just says, faith without action is dead faith. I can say what I believe, but unless I'm pressed into action, then it, it, it could be empty, hollow faith. So when we accept God's invitation, we experience Him through our obedience, and God accomplishes His work through us. So as we allow God to use us, we experience Him in even greater and greater ways. It prepares us then for the next time He calls us. It, it, it prepares us when we're going through trials. We lean on God. And as we experience God, our faith in Him grows. As, as I said earlier, our mission is always about people. It's never programs. It's never buildings. It's always about people, helping them take their next step towards Jesus Christ. And I say from accepting Him as Savior to becoming a, a more faithful disciple. Disciple. We must be willing to be willing to be used. But here's the key. To truly experience God, we must have a relationship to Jesus Christ. To fully embrace that. See, only through Jesus can we have this correct view of God. Jonah had an incorrect view. Because he knew God was gracious, but he thought he was gracious just to the people of Israel. He didn't think those people of Nineveh deserved Love, mercy, grace. So here's the key point of this book. We think it's about Jonah. It's not about Jonah. It's about God's love and compassion extended even to the most vile. It's always about God. You know, we've been talking about people these last few weeks. But it's always been about God and what He can do. It's His desire to reach out to everyone, to see them repent, to see them believe to accept His love made real through Jesus Christ. So by contrast with Jonah, God the Father sent Jesus the Son to earth to reach out to us. Jesus had no reservations. Jesus never went in the opposite direction. Jesus calls us to repent and become members of the kingdom of God. See, only when we see Jesus doing what He did for us, when we see what He did, we can really have our hearts changed. Only when we see Jesus doing what He did for us can we have the faith, courage, and obedience to say, as our last song is going to ask, and say, I'll go where you want me to go. Only because of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank You for reminding us how, how loving and gracious You are. And You want to use us. And and yes, you even use us when we turn you down, but you keep calling. So help us to be more obedient, to listen for you as you send us and ask us to be your hands and feet here on earth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.